welcome to Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a community of diverse beliefs and experiences, nurturing the liberal religious spirit and united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your life's journey, you are welcome here. Whether you gather with us every Sunday, once or twice a year, or are with us this morning for the first time, we welcome you. I'm Jessica Schultz, and I'll be the worship associate today. Our service is led by our wonderful minister, Reverend Sharon Wiley. Our worship musician this morning is John Schultz. Our song leaders are Patty Carlisle and Tom Carlstrom. Our tech team is Hope Campbell, Sarah Komnick, and maybe Dean Gadette, maybe not Dean Gadette, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> our greeters are Judy Cavallo and Steve, oh, I think our greeter was Shannon Anderson. And, and it looks like Ralph is helping too, so Ralph Peters. Welcome to our Sunday worship service. Welcome to those of you here in the chapel and welcome to those of you watching online using Zoom. For those of us in the chapel, you will notice that we have the windows open. This is to ensure good air circulation. There are four air purifiers in the room, but if you are uncomfortable for any reason, please feel free to leave the chapel and you'll be able to hear what's going on from outside on the courtyard. We are always delighted to see newcomers joining us for worship. As a newcomer, you might be interested in the groups and activities we offer here at Chalice. A good way to get this information is through our weekly email newsletter. Online newcomers will receive an email invitation to join our email list after the service. In-person newcomers, if you haven't already given us your email address when you signed in, please be sure to share it before you leave. And now let's take a breath together. I'm Judy Cavallo. I'm Steve Schlesinger. And we live on land stolen from, from the, the Pion Coetion, now known as San, San Marcos. Marcos. My name is Dennis Brown, and I live on land stolen from the Pion Coetion, now known as Marietta. My name is Dre Marsh, and I live on land stolen from the Kumeyaay and Pion Coetion, now known as Escondido. My name is Jeff Harlig. I live on land stolen from the Payam Quisham. That area is now known as Vista. I'm Debbie Street Idell. I live on land stolen from the Kumeyaay. It's now known as Scripps Ranch. My name is Amaki Ayipa, and I live on land stolen from the Payam Quisham, now known as San Marcos. Now we light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. I'd like to invite Shannon Anderson to light our chalice this morning. Our chalice lighting words come from Eric A. Helliger, Heller Wagner. Blessed is this fire that burns deep in the soul. It is the flame of human spirit touched into being by the mystery of life. It is the fire of reason, the fire of compassion, the fire of community, the fire of justice, the fire of faith. It is the fire of love burning deep in the human heart, the divine glow in every life.
Our service this morning celebrates <clears throat> that science and reason are one of the many are some of the many sources of our faith tradition. The words of our call to worship come from the Reverend Don Shea Cooley. The diversity of the human species is astounding. The fact that we can gather together for a common experience is nothing short of a miracle. Today, let us celebrate some of our differences. Let us celebrate those who worship best through music, for whom the holy speaks through rhythm and harmony, pitch and meter. Let us celebrate the interpersonal worshiper who finds the sacred in relationships and in community. Let us celebrate those who worship best through the visual world, for whom the divine spark speaks through the aesthetics of space. Let us celebrate the verbal and linguistic worshiper for whom words and language, stories and poetry are sacred sources of joy and revelation. Let us celebrate those to whom the divine might be found in logical reasoning, in mathematics and through critical thinking. Let us celebrate the intrapersonal worshiper, those who experience the holy as they listen to the still small voice within themselves. Let us celebrate those who worship best through their bodies, those to whom the divine speaks through movement and physical action. And let us celebrate the naturalistic worshiper for whom the sacred is found in plants and animals, mountains and valleys, deserts and forests, oceans and streams. Today, may we find a way to connect with the ultimate, each according to our own ways of understanding and experiencing the world. May we bring our whole selves to this worship service and celebrate the diversity among us. Let us worship together. You're invited to rise in spirit to join in singing. Yeah. 
Our Sunday worship is the shared spiritual practice of our community, and we tend to the congregation during this time by sharing and honoring our joys and sorrows. Bruce Campbell, one of our founding members, passed away a week ago. In recognition of his physical death, we extinguish the flaming chalice that marks our gathering. We now light a candle of remembrance in recognition that Bruce's influence on our community endures. Finally, we relight our flaming chalice in recognition that through our memories of Bruce and through the blessings of his many contributions here, our congregation is strengthened and renewed. The light of our community shines ever on. In mystery we are born, in mystery we live, in mystery we die. Here in the chapel, you are welcome to write your joy or sorrow onto a candle card, which will be collected from you. Online, please write your joy or sorrow, including your name, into the chat box. These joys and sorrows will be spoken out loud, and then this part of the service is removed from the recording that goes on to YouTube, so your sharing won't be publicly available online. We have a few minutes of music, so you can write down what you would like to share. And if you would like to send me a confidential note about your joy or sorrow, or to make a prayer request, please email me. My email address will be on screen.
we light a final pillar candle for all the joys and sorrows in our community that may go unshared and unspoken this morning. These two are held in the love and support of our community. And now I invite the children and anyone else who would like to come forward uh, for our story. Our story is called Ada Twist Scientist, written by Andrea Beatty and illustrated by David Roberts. Ada Marie, Ada Marie, said not a word till the day she turned three. She bounced in her crib and looked all around, observing the world, but not making a sound. She learned how to climb and made her big break with a trail of chaos left in her wake. She ran through the day chasing each sound and sight and didn't slow down till she conked out at night. Her parents were frazzled, but tried not to freak as Ada grew bigger and still did not speak. Clearly young Ada with lots in her head would have something to say when it ought to be said. That's just what happened when Ada turned three. She tore through the house on a fact-finding spree and climbed up the clock just as high as she could. Her parents yelled, stop! as all good parents would. Ada's chin quivered, but she did not cry. She took a deep breath and she simply asked, why? Why does it tick and why does it talk? Why don't we call it a granddaughter clock? Why are there pointy things stuck to a rose? Why are there hairs up inside of your nose? She started with why, and then what, how, and when. By bedtime, she came back to why once again. She drifted to sleep as her dazed parents smiled at the curious thoughts of their curious child who wanted to know what the world was about. They kissed her and whispered, you'll figure it out. Her parents kept up with their high-flying kid whose questions and chaos both grew as she did. Even Miss Greer found her hands were quite full when young Ada's chaos wreaked havoc at school. But this much was clear about Miss Ada Twist. She had all the traits of a great scientist. Ada was busy that first day of spring, testing the sounds that make mockingbirds sing when a horrible stench whacked her right in the nose, a pungent aroma that curled up her toes. Zowie, said Ada, which got her to thinking, what is the source of that terrible stinking? How does a nose know there's something to smell? And does it still stink if there's no nose to tell? She rattled off questions and tapped on her chin, She'd start at the start where she ought to begin. A mystery, a riddle, a puzzle, a quest. This was the moment that Ada loved best. Ada did research to learn all she could of smelling and smells, both the stinky and good. One hypothesis Ada thought could be true. The terrible stink came from dad's cabbage stew. She tested and tested, but soon Ada knew it was time to come up with hypothesis two. Then zowie, the stink struck again, just like that. Hypothesis two, it's caused by the cat. The cat couldn't make such a stink on its own. It needed perfume and some fancy cologne. So young Ada tested. The test was a flop. She started again, but her parents yelled, stop. Ada Marie, Ada Marie, to the thinking chair now, by the time we count three. Enough, said her mother. That's it, said her dad. Her parents were frustrated, frazzled, and mad. 
Why, Ada questioned. Her mother said, no. What, Ada queried. Her father said, go. You've ruined our supper. You've made the cat stink. Enough with your questions. Now sit there and think. She looked at her parents. Her heart turned to goo. Poor Ada Twist didn't know what to do. She sat all alone by herself in the hall, and Ada, once more, could say nothing at all. And so Ada sat, and she sat, and she sat, and she thought about science and stew and the cat, and how her experiments made such a big mess. Does it have to be so? Is that part of success? Are messes a problem? <laughs> and while she was thinking, what was the source of that terrible stinking? Ada Marie did what scientists do. She asked a small question, and then she asked two. And each of those led her to three questions more, and some of those questions resulted in four. As Ada got thinking, she really dug in. She scribbled her questions and tapped on her chin. She started at why and then what, how, and when. At the end of the hall, she reached why once again. Her parents calmed down and they came back to talk. They looked at the hallway and just had to gawk. No patch of bare paint could be seen on the wall. The thinking chair now was the great thinking hall. They watched their young daughter and sighed as they did. What would they do with this curious kid who wanted to know what the world was about? They smiled and whispered, we'll figure it out. And that's what they did, because that's what you do when your kid has a passion and heart that is true. They remade their world. Now they're all in the act of helping young Ada sort fiction from fact. She asks lots of questions. How could she resist? It's all in the heart of a young scientist. And as for that smell, what can Ada Twist do but learn all she can with her friends in grade two? Will they discover the stink that curls toes? Well, that is the question. And someday, who knows? Most religious people in America fully embrace science. So the, the argument that religion has some issue with science applies to a small fraction of those who declare that they are religious. They just happen to be a very vocal fraction, and so you get the impression that there's more of them than there actually is. It's actually the minority of religious people who reject science or feel threatened by it or or want to sort of undo or, with, or, or restrict the, where science can go. The, the rest, you know, are just fine with science and has been that way ever since the beginning. And by the way, there's no tradition of scientists knocking down the door, the Sunday school door, telling the preacher what to teach. There's no tradition of scientists picketing outside of churches, nor should there be some emergent tradition of uh, religious fundamentalists trying to change the curriculum in the science classroom. There've been, there's been a happy coexistence for centuries. And for that to change now would be, would be unfortunate.
because I, I've seen this happen in other nations and other states where the consequences are that you just basically recede back to the cave because that's where you land when you undermine the scientific and technological innovations that come about when you're a properly trained, trained scientist or technologist. Consider also that in America, 40% of American scientists are religious. So this notion that there's some, um, that if you're a scientist, you're an atheist, or if you're religious, you're not a scientist, that's just empirically false. It's an empirically false statement. And what I mean by religious is, you can pose the question in a way that is unambiguous. You don't ask, well, do you go to church every Sunday? Because plenty of people go to church like just for the pie, you know, or the, the, the social scene after, after the service. You ask people, do you pray to a personal God? If you say yes to that, you're religious by, pre by presumably anybody's standards of your, of, your, of your conduct. And it's the yes to that question that applies to 40% of scientists. So uh, while there are plenty of atheists who are scientists or not scientists, to paint this as some um, built-in conflict is, there may be a conflict, but many, plenty of people in this country coexist in both worlds. In 2011, a movie came out called Contagion. Maybe some of you saw it, starring Kate Winslet, Matt Damon, Lawrence Fishburne, and Jude Law. Imagining what it might be like if there were ever a global pandemic. The movie did okay when it first came out, but it became very popular again in 2020 during the actual COVID pandemic, as people watched it hoping for information about how the pandemic might end. I personally wasn't interested in watching it until after vaccines became available. <laughs> I had enough pandemic. <laughs> but by the time I watched it, I wasn't panicky or scared anymore, just fascinated. It's interesting to watch someone's imagination about how a pandemic would unfold and compare it to how it actually happened. One of the things the film could not foresee at all, nor could any of us really, was the resistance of many people to taking safety precautions and to being vaccinated. And although the film correctly envisioned that there would be people profiting off of spreading medical misinformation, there was no inkling of the role that some religious communities would play in politicizing the pandemic. From the earliest days in March 2020, there were churches that refused to stop meeting. Stories of church choirs and groups of congregants falling ill made headlines as some communities declared that meeting in person during a pandemic was a matter of religious freedom, a stance that was eventually upheld by the Supreme Court. Now, before I get too far along, I want to remind all of us that religious groups overwhelmingly supported precautions for COVID and encouraged people to get vaccinated. No major religious groups in the United States told people not to get vaccinated or not to wear masks. The National Association of Evangelicals and Pope Francis both voiced their support for vaccination efforts. Even Christian scientists the religious group, perhaps the most doctrinally opposed to modern medical treatment, encouraged members to cooperate with measures considered necessary by public health officials. Orthodox Jewish and Muslim leaders, as well as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints also voiced their support for vaccines. In spite of that, COVID safety became intertwined with religion and politics and I suspect that's some of what many of us will remember for years to come. On the one hand, the challenges of the pandemic powerfully united the majority of people. But on the other hand, the sense of there being pronounced divisions in our country is even stronger now than it was when the pandemic began. It is worth understanding better 
some of the religious differences that actually divide us. It's funny that people imagine that religions are divided by having different beliefs about things like God and death. But the major faith traditions of the world have far more in common than they do differences. This is why Unitarian Universalism finds so much that is meaningful and valuable in all faith traditions. But the pandemic highlighted a significant area of difference, how religious traditions understand health care and healing. Author Hector Avalos was a cultural anthropologist and a professor of religious studies at Iowa State University. His book, Healthcare and the Rise of Christianity, was published in 1999. In it, Avalos argues that the Christian New Testament and its recurring stories of Jesus as healer can be read as criticism of healthcare systems in ancient times. He also suggests that the New Testament can be read as introducing healthcare reforms. Such reforms included reduced cost of healthcare, access to treatment, and removal of stigma from those suffering from chronic disease. These reforms, he argues, were a key component to the development of a Christian movement and its ability to attract converts. He illustrates how religion and healthcare concerns can be intertwined in our modern times with the story of a woman who, after spending most of her money on doctors to treat her cancer, then rejected her Catholic faith in favor of a Pentecostal group that treated her illness with prayer and anointment with oil. Avalos notes that it's not unusual for religious converts to be initially attracted to a new group because of practical health care concerns. This example is a powerful one that speaks to the experience many have of finding religion after a death in the family or a medical crisis. The common assumption is that such events bring one to ask theological questions about the meaning of life and the possibility of an afterlife. But as this case illustrates, theological questions may have nothing to do with the conversion experience of some, nor did the success or failure of the treatment, although the woman in this story initially felt better, she nevertheless remained in poor health. Avalos' theory is that all things being equal, i.e. given that cancer can't be cured, a religion that can offer free medical treatment like prayer and oil, along with simplicity of care, a church being more convenient to visit than a hospital or a clinic, that this kind of religious health care is preferable to more expensive and complicated alternatives. He goes on to describe that compared to the other religions of the time period, Christianity's version of healthcare was the only one that offered the following advantages to its followers. That treatment for illness be free, simple, physically accessible, available at any time, short in duration, and does not vary according to a patient's social or religious status. In other words, the approximately 41 healings ascribed to Jesus in the Gospels illustrate a healthcare system wherein faith is the primary component, faith that is free and available to all, not just the wealthy. Historically, the first public hospital was Christian, rooted in concepts of charity and philanthropy founded toward the end of the fourth century. Catholic hospitals and other religious institutions are a significant part of the United States healthcare system. One out of every five hospital beds in the United States resides in a religious hospital. And three quarters of those religious hospitals are Catholic hospitals. We have only to look at our own congregation to see how healthcare and religious community come together here. 
I provide pastoral care. We as a congregation offer hospital and home visits for the sick or elderly. We bring food to people's homes in times of crisis. I preach often on mental health. And of course, we just survived a global pandemic when many of you were strengthened by looking to our community for guidance on safety precautions. All these actions are indeed forms of healthcare. It is also not unusual for congregations, even Unitarian Universalist congregations, to have a congregation nurse to do things like providing blood pressure screenings throughout the year, flu vaccine clinics in the fall, health education and other services, resources and referrals, organizing CPR and first aid certification classes. At the denominational level, the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations has issued numerous social witness statements over the past 60 years, articulating UU beliefs and positions regarding health insurance, reproductive health, mental health, and other issues related to health care. So you get my point. <laughs> Religion and health care are profoundly connected and have been for centuries. In the big picture, we already knew that people's religious beliefs sometimes led them to medical, medical decisions not supported by science. For example, we sometimes read news stories about parents failing to provide adequate care for their children due to religious beliefs that prohibit certain medical procedures. These kinds of things make the news as um, social workers and ethicists get involved. But for the most part, Peter's, people's medical decisions are private. And so we had perhaps been unaware of what it looks like when people's religious beliefs interfere with their acceptance of modern medical practices. Beliefs like God controls everything. Therefore, everything that is happening, good or bad, must be because that's how God wants it to be. Implicit in this belief is that people who died of COVID must have deserved it because God let it happen. The belief that prayers to God will overcome illness. Therefore, there is no need to protect against illness because faith in God can and will be enough. The belief that people of faith will be rewarded by God with health and prosperity. Therefore, people of faith don't have anything to fear from a virus. And in fact, taking precautions against a virus demonstrates unacceptably that you doubt God, that you are lacking in faith. These beliefs can only exist in opposition to science. To believe that God controls everything is to dismiss that humans have free will and that our actions have consequences. To believe that prayers will overcome illness is to ignore all that science teaches us about how illness develops and how medicine and other treatments work. To believe that good people are rewarded with health and prosperity is to be out of touch with reality, where bad things happen to good people all the time. So again, let me remind you, as Neil deGrasse Tyson told us just a bit ago, most religious people in America fully embrace science. So the argument that religion has some issue with science applies to a small fraction of those who declare that they are religious. They just happen to be a very vocal fraction. Indeed, they are. We can and should be proud that our faith tradition fully embraces, embraces the lessons of science. We draw inspiration and guidance from humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. This embrace goes back to the Humanist Manifesto, written in 1933, and back further to Charles Darwin's theory of evolution in the mid-1800s. Unitarianism and Universalism 
even in their earliest expressions, have always been about questioning, about using logic to interrogate theological understandings and teachings. I know you share my worries over how our country is to make progress when there are people who seem to have lost touch with reality, seem unable to distinguish facts from lies. Of course, we support freedom of religion and each person's right to their own beliefs. And we can also observe the outcome when religious adherents are taught to believe and never to doubt, to follow and never to question. Critical thinking is a necessary skill to being a responsible citizen. The movie Contagion ended with a vaccine becoming available and people fighting over the vaccine, trying to steal it. The movie had also imagined that the pandemic would bring on rioting and looting, people turning on each other. The film captured the worst of human behavior, but failed to imagine the best, the ways in the actual pandemic that we helped each other. We were patient with each other. The vast majority of people wore masks and kept their distance and were kind to each other. As we continue to make our way out of the pandemic and through the challenges of these complex and unsettling times, may each of us here remember the best that humanity has to offer each other and may we strive to embody and uphold those ideals. May it be so. You're invited to join in singing a new hymn. I'm told a difficult hymn, but the lyrics are really great. <laughs> so this is what we're going to do. John will play uh, one verse of it so you can hear what the melody sounds like. And then Tom and I will sing the first verse so that you can hear what the words sound like, and we'll all then sing the entire song together. Repeating. Repeating the first verse, yes. again together. Sunday offering is an expression of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. 
As Buddhist teacher Joseph Goldstein has said, it's important to understand that generosity is a practice. It's not just a single event. It's a quality in our hearts and minds we can develop and cultivate. Please text your donation to Chalice. If you haven't texted a donation before, know that once you text the amount, you'll get a reply with a link to follow to enter your credit card information. And if you've already entered this information previously, then when you've donated, you won't have to enter it again. If your Sunday donation is meant to be a part of your pledge payment, please be sure to indicate pledge after the dollar amount. The phone number for text donations will be on screen in a moment. If you prefer to make an in-person donation of cash or check, there are envelopes and a donation box to the left of the chapel double doors. You can leave these donations after the service if you like. Please give generously. It's important to know, I'm sorry, that uh, this song I'm about to play is a hymn in our hymnal that's written by Jim Scott, who's also the person who wrote the first hymn we sang, Gather the Spirit. One year. You might <laughs> Please join in dedicating our offering with words of with words of affirmation. At Chalice UU Congregation, our mission is to act to promote UU principles in ourselves and in the wider world. Hello, world. Hello, hello, hello. One, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. Hey, there we go too. All right. Uh, this this is a song by Peter Mayer. Actually, one of his newer songs. Uh, I don't. I, I'm not actually sure it's on an album yet. He has some songs that he's just put out on his website, uh, and I'm, and and I believe this is one of them. It's called The Wonder. Peter Mayer. Peter Mayer is a singer songwriter from Minnesota, which is very important when you look him up on the internet because there's two Peter Mayers and their music is intertwined on like iTunes. So. Uh, look for Peter Mayer, Minnesota uh, musician. Uh, he uh, plays. Uh, he plays a lot around the, uh, the Midwest, uh, and has been out here a number of times. And has. And I know a number of us have seen him. Uh, have seen him at the at the Esalana Beach and other places. He's a fantastic singer songwriter, and uh, um, he is. And, and he embodies just about every every concept uh, uh, of of of, uh, of being a Unitarian Universalist, like this one. This is called The Wonder. Mm -hmm. 
Here's to the spark in the dark whence we all came. Here's to the ride on the light of the Big Bang. Here's to the photons, the mighty protons. Here's to gravity that helped turn the sun on. Here's to the first twitch of life in the ocean. Here's to the magical molecular potion. Here's to the green leaf. Here's to the heartbeat. Here's to the living cell like a city unseen. Here's to the wonder, wonder of it all. Here's to the wonder, the wonder of it all. Here's to the wonder. seconds and the minutes and the hours. Here's to the sources and the forces and the power that set the hills down, that spun the earth round, that turned the atoms into planets and the flowers. Here's to the infinite spaces over and under. Here's to unreachable places, uncountable numbers. Here's to the night sky years that go by. Here's to the trillion, trillion atoms in your eye. Here's to the wonder, the wonder of it all. Here's to the wonder, the wonder of it all. Here's to the wonder, the wonder. Here's to the wonder of it all. Here's to the burning light of the possibilities that still happen somehow. <laughs> Here's two magnificent mysteries that we're even here now. Thinking and speaking, waking and sleeping, working out our destiny in that great chain of being. Here's to the ways we're connected to each other, lovers and neighbors and friends, sisters and comes from the Reverend Lynn Cox. Spirit of life, who draws us together in a web of holy relationships, make your presence known with us and in us and among us. Remind us that we are not alone in history. Ignite us with the courage of our living tradition. Remind us that we are not alone in entering the future anchor us with patience and perseverance. Remind us that we are not alone in our times of grief and pain. Comfort us with your spirit manifest in human hands and voices. Remind us that we are not alone in joy and wonder. Inspire us to honor and extend the beauty we find in this world. Divine music of the universe, let our hearts beat 
in diverse and harmonious rhythms, cooperating with an everlasting dance of love. May we move with the rhythms of peace. May we move with the rhythms of compassion. May we move with the rhythms of justice. Source of stars and planets and water and land. Open our hearts to all of our neighbors. Open our souls to a renewal of faith. Open our hands to join together in the work ahead. So be it, blessed be, and amen. You are invited again to rise in body or spirit. Our closing words come from Barbara Cheatham. And now we take our leave. Before we gather here again, may each of us bring happiness into another's life. May we each be surprised by the gifts that surround us. May each of us be enlivened by constant curiosity. And may we remain together in spirit till the hour we meet again. Love and blessing to you. To each of you and blessed be you are invited to close our time together by singing the well and after the closing hymn please enjoy our social hour on the courtyard and online <laughs>
sweet.